Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. I work part-time at a community center fitness area. Most of the time, the people are lovely. We have regulars and it's nice to see them. They work out. They clean up after themselves. They leave. It's great. Some days it gets annoying. The community center is directly attached to a local high school. The very nice pool often holds high school swim meets and water polo matches and whatnot. To get to the pool observation deck, one must cut through said fitness center. On a game or meet day, a lot of people who normally wouldn't have access to our very large expansive gym with super expensive equipment can suddenly be in the building and causing all kinds of trouble. I only mention this because you have to be extra careful to enforce rules on these days in case some stranger decides to try and deadlift 400 LBs and breaks a fibula or something. This was one of those days. Mr. Karen is a fellow I've never seen. No biggie. New member, perhaps. Day pass, maybe. He has a small child with him. My estimation is the child is five-ish. The man is in jeans and a sweater. This seems strange, but who the hell am I to judge what people exercise in? Our rules pretty explicitly state that children cannot use any equipment unless they are above age 14. From 8 and above, they are welcome to use our track as long as a guardian is in the building. The man and kid are on bikes. To be fair, the kid isn't being a twat. That happens a lot, too. Kids will run in like psychos and try to use a rower and inevitably squish a finger or drop a weight. So, props to him, I guess. I walk up and apologize and tell him kid can't be on equipment, but he is more than welcome to use the track. Mr. Karen loses. His. Mine. M.K.Y.? He's not doing anything. Me. You're right, but it's our rules. I'm sorry. Kids have to be older than eight to use our track unsupervised, but he can't be on our equipment. M.K. yelling now. How you know he's not eight? Me. Looking at him like he's nuts. What? M.K. You assumed his age. I can do whatever I want. Me. I did assume. I'm sorry. He certainly isn't over 14, so he can't be on equipment. He asks for my manager, who tells him the same thing and says this classic line. I don't pay 1000 a year to be a member here for you to tell me what I can and can't do. He then asks for the Parks and Re-City manager's contact. We give it to him. He tells me to have all the way off and he leaves. Later, I tell my other boss about this. They go down to registration to see who this dude is. Turns out, not a member. They have no record of it. Most likely came to watch water polo. So he freaked out and lied to try and get his way. He sucks. This happened several years ago during my 31 female. And you're as a server at a restaurant in a decently touristy area. I have an entire smorgasbord of wild stories. Local politicians getting huffy at not getting special treatment. 90 yo men threatening to spank me, two lawyer parents arguing why their 16 yo daughter should be allowed to drink as though it were a courtroom, etc. Along with your average restaurant, no one matured past high school work environment. Without getting too specific about where I was, the restaurant was somewhat dog themed in the name and like two of the decorations. But outside of that, it was largely just a pub style restaurant. But with our name, most folks expected us to be a dog friendly establishment. Unfortunately, shortly before I started working there, the health department had begun to crack down on restaurants in the area allowing dogs in, which was against the health code. As such, in an effort to live up to our name, management chucked off an arm and a leg to get permission to have a dog-friendly section on the patio. Part of the permission came with several rules like dogs can't sit in chairs or on tables, or dogs must be on leash or in carriage, or dogs must have separate entrance and exit. Stuff that if you sit down and think about it, it, makes sense for protecting people who may have an allergy or a phobia or any other reason to avoid a dog in public. The following happened shortly before my 20th birthday, in the middle of summer. It was cloudy. It was humid. Bugs were flying. And absolutely no one wanted to sit on the patio. I was a hostess that day, and I felt really bad for my patio server who wasn't getting any business. Until love. A middle-aged woman appears. I'll call her unentitled woman wife, or you for short. You? W? My husband and I have a dog and we're hoping to sit out on the patio. Me. Great. 
Just give me a second and I'll get you set up in the dog, friendly section. I collect their menus and lead you outside to find her husband, who I will lovingly refer to as Entitled Chair Guy, or ECG, along with a cute elderly beagle already sitting in the dog, free section. For the record, all the patio tables had little signs on them denoting them as dog-friendly or dog-free to make it easy on people. So this ECG, had he been using his eyes, would have easily solved our first encounter before it began. Me and my chippiest customer service voice. Just so you know, you are in the dog-free section right now. But if you move over just one table, you'll be in the dog-friendly section and we can get you started. ACG looks up from his phone and his dark, beady eyes meet mine. ACG in a seething tone. Are you serious? Now I am a bit taken aback at the hostility at such a basic request, but I'm no novice in shitty customers. I repeat the rules and explain it's due to the restaurant needing to follow the health code. He continues to protest. His wife jumps in and starts pleading that it's just one table. Why don't we just move? And now I feel even worse for her. Finally, he throws his hands in the air and shouts, Fine, but if my dog gets hit by a car, are you the one I sue? Context. The dog-friendly section was adjacent to the sidewalk, which was adjacent to the road, so if you were going to be hit by a car, it was technically the most likely spot. It also had never happened in the restaurant's multi-decade lifespan. At this point, my irritation meter is firmly in the red as I realize he's one of those entitled people, the ones who spit and threaten when they don't get their way. I shoot and even smile and say, That's probably a question from a manager. ECG. Hey, or your attorney. He really thinks he got me with that zinger as I'm setting him down in the dog-friendly section. But really, I'm just hiding laughs, because these are the most pathetic kinds of people we serve. I just warn his server he's a douche and go on with my day. I later bring out a bowl of water for the dog because it's hot and gross and the poor thing shouldn't be dehydrated. Yeah, I know. It was standard practice for us to bring dogs water while their owners ate. I set it down, and immediately. ECG, is that tap water or bottled water? Me fighting the urge to deadpan. It's tap water, sir. Would you like me to go out and buy bottled water? At that point, the dog begins drinking, and ECG slams his hand on the table and shouts, Well, it's too late now. Let's better hope it's not poisoned. Now the guy has me wondering if his dog is up to date on its shots or if he's an anti-vaxxer. His server told me he later poured out the water. I have no clue if she was referring to his water or his dog's water, but he had loudly complained there were bugs in it. I'd like to remind you, dear reader, that it was a disgusting, humid, muggy summer day, and this man decided to eat outside. While I do understand the initial revulsion at seeing a bug in your meal or drink, he was in the bug's world, dear reader, not ours, and we had no control over that. We still replaced his water, though. About 20 minutes later, his entree is ordered. He and his wife are eating an appetizer. The dog is chilling, and some other mad soul walks inside and asks to sit on the patio. Just to be petty, I put him in the chair ACG had originally commandeered. But then I look over... ECG had his beagle in his lap while he was eating his food. If you remember from about 10 years ago when I was explaining some of the mandates we got from the health department, one of them was dogs can't sit in chairs or on tables. And while some of you might contest it, the dog being in his lap constituted being in a chair in the health department's eyes. Now I didn't want to deal with this. But I knew that between me and his server, on the one in a million chance that a health official just happened to walk by and see us breaking the rules, one of us would get thrown under the bus. So, as you goes inside to order a drink from the bar, I slap on my customer service voice and stroll over to their table. Me. He. Sir. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I need to tell you that it's unfortunately against the health code for your dog to be in the chair with you. ECG goes silent for a few moments, simmering until... Show me the health code. Me. Excuse me? ECG. I'm not doing anything unless you show me the health code. At this point, my patience is wafer thin. This man is finding ways to push all the most annoying buttons rather than just following a basic rule and letting all of us get on with our days. Rather than continue with him and risk losing my temper, I go back inside to cool down and find a manager. I find one. We go to the office and she prints out the list of rules emailed to us by the health department. Then she holds up the paper to me and says, Now, 
this can go one of two ways. I can take this down to him and you never have to see him again, or you can take this down to him and get that smug, satisfied feeling of telling an asshole you were right. This is where I may have erred, dear readers. For you see, I really didn't want to see this mother effer again. His beady black eyes, his thin, grease-black hair, his rubbery white skin, the man looked like death himself. Stoking that fire to say my ego could go terribly wrong, foreshadowing. But I really, really wanted that smug, satisfied feeling of telling an asshole I was right. What can I say? I wasn't even 20. Mustering my courage, I take the paper, and as I walk back outside, I internally hype myself up until I'm strutting over to ECG's table. I hand him the paper. Me? Yes, sir. Here is the health code, as you requested, as you can see here. It says we cannot allow dogs to sit in the chairs or we get a massive fine. ECG takes the paper and peers down at the rule carefully, then analyzes the whole paper as if looking for a loophole. But he must not have found one, because instead he throws the paper on the ground and says, You can shove that up your butt. This man finally gave me a reason to drop the customer service voice, which, for the record, is very light and high-pitched. My normal talking voice is surprisingly deep and not as cheery. So I glare down ECG, drop my register, and growl, Sir, put the dog on the ground or leave. This startled him at first, but he, being a man with an attorney and me being a short little waitress working for pennies after all, regathers himself quickly. He scoops up his dog in his arms, stands, then takes his heavy metal chair and flings it behind him. It goes under our railing and nearly strikes two random women walking by. And then, dear reader, the piece de resistance, he sits down. On the ground. With his dog in his lap. Now, at this point, I've seen a lot in my service industry career. I can handle someone throwing a temper tantrum. I can't handle someone throwing a chair. Luckily, the two women he'd very nearly assaulted know exactly what to do. They leer over him from behind the railing and begin screaming, gone full Karen for justice on this guy's ass. The more they screamed, the more he shrank, and we'd attracted a small crowd of attention. Then they turned their gaze to me. Karen's for justice. Oh my gosh, sweetie, are you okay? You know, we're from Brooklyn, and even we find this appalling... Suddenly I snap back to reality and realize I'd been rescued. I laugh and join a conversation with the women with the pouting man between us. I not so subtly bemoan the immaturity and entitlement I saw on a daily basis. Overall, they were very sweet. Finally, ECG's server comes out, you in town. She'd been inside this whole time, completely unaware of her husband's outburst. She looks utterly horrified and ashamed. Their server lets me know the manager is on her way immediately. We file inside and all the employees crowd around a nearby window to watch as our manager goes out. ECG keeps sticking his finger in her face, speaking through gritted teeth, looking like he's about to pop a vessel. All the while, you is mortified, and our manager is bored. Finally, they leave. My manager comes back inside and tells us, Okay, he called me C-word and told me to go screw myself, and if he ever comes back, we're calling the police. You won't believe the absolute roller coaster of a ride I had on the bus today. I mean, we all know public transport can be a wild adventure, but today took the cake, the frosting, and probably the whole bakery. So grab a snack and settle in for the tale of the lady of the lost earbud and the bus driver with a temper. Now, let me set the scene. Yours truly, just an ordinary soul who's learned to navigate the ins and outs of the daily bus grind was minding their own business on the homeward-bound ride. Picture me casually jamming to my latest playlist, headphones plugged in, and occasionally eavesdropping on bits of conversation from my fellow passengers. The sun was setting, casting a warm, golden hue over everything. A pretty decent end to a regular day. That's what happened. Out of the blue, this piercing shriek split the air. I'm talking about the kind of scream that makes you drop your phone, and question your existence. All eyes swiveled toward the source, which was none other than a lady in her early thirties, gesticulating wildly with her phone plastered to her ear. Oh boy, here we go. She's yammering away like there's no tomorrow, and I'm trying to piece together the situation from the fragments I'm catching. Apparently, 
she had dropped one of her precious earbuds. Yeah, you heard that right. Just one tiny earbud. And it was like the world was about to implode. I mean, we've all been there, right? But this lady was taking it to a whole new level. So, as she's continuing her one-woman opera, she suddenly locks eyes with the bus driver through the rearview mirror. And that's when things took an unexpected turn. She starts yelling at the poor guy like he's the root of all her earbud-related miseries. Stop this bus right now. You hear me? Stop. Now, here's where things get even crazier. We're on this bridge that's practically a no-stop zone. You know, the kind where if you slam on the brakes, you'll send half the passengers flying. But this lady, bless her heart, is on a mission. She's demanding the impossible. And it's clear that the bus driver is torn between keeping his cool and not causing a mass panic. Now, I've got to hand it to this bus driver. He's got nerves of steel. Or at least he did until this lady started testing them. With a look that could kill and probably did a little, he manages to bring the bus to a screeching halt without causing a ten-car pileup on the bridge. The collective gasp from the passengers was like something out of a cheesy horror movie. Miraculously, we didn't crash, but it was a near thing. At this point, I'm just trying to enjoy my own personal concert while the world around me seems to have taken a detour to crazy town. And then, like a whirlwind of fury, the lady storms off the bus, her mission apparently accomplished. But wait. There's more. She dashes across the road like a woman possessed, dodging cars and pedestrians like a real-life frogger champion. And what do you know? The big reveal. She dropped her earbud. Yes, you read that correctly. She disrupted the entire bus, brought us to the brink of disaster, all for the sake of a single, solitary earbud. I'm talking about the kind that costs less than your daily coffee fix. The bus driver, who by now has probably lost a year off his life, just stares incredulously as she holds up her prize like it's the Holy Grail. The lady, triumphant in her conquest, takes a victory lap back to the bus, her head held high and her earbuds safely stashed away like it's a precious gem. But let me tell you, the bus driver was having none of it. As she steps back on, he goes off like a volcano that's been dormant for centuries. Do you have any idea what you just put everyone through? We could have crashed back there. All this for a dang earbud. You nearly gave me a heart attack. He's yelling, veins popping, face red as a tomato. And the rest of us, well, we're a mix of shock, relief, and trying not to burst into laughter at the sheer absurdity of it all. The lady, now slightly sheepish, mumbles something about not wanting to lose the pair. The bus driver just throws up his hands like he's surrendering to the madness and gives her a piece of his mind in a way that only someone who's been driving this route for decades can It's a masterpiece of exasperation and bewildered disbelief. Finally, he waves her off the bus with a just-go lady. And please, for the love of everything, hold on to those earbuds like they're made of gold. And off she goes back into the urban wilderness, probably to regale her friends with the epic saga of the misplaced earbud that brought a bus to its knees. I thought I would share my highlights of moments I've encountered as a disabled person and entitled parents. There are so many more I regularly come across, especially on public transport. Bus encounter. On the bus, a mother marched over demanding, you can stand, right? My child needs to sit, despite my walking stick resting beside me. Regular run. In my usual encounter with this one entitled dad awaits me on the tram. No wheelchair today. He has said when I use my crutches or a different mobility aid. Must be a miracle. He has also said, food shopping delivery debacle. Knocking on my door, my downstairs neighbor has moaned at me about the food shopping delivery van parked outside. She has said it's entitled brats like you hogging the spots. Good job I have a roommate who is calmer than me when it comes to explaining that it's needed for me. Also explaining how I get more freedom than, say, her doing my food shopping for me. Curiosity gone awry. I find myself fairly often approached by children, encouraged by parents to ask what's wrong with you. I will offer a vague response like I got hurt or something like that, which normally stops it. Then there's the parents insisting on knowing my medical history. Misconstrued medication. On the bus, I reach for my medication, only to be accused by a parent nearby of drug use. Trump standoff. Attempting to board the tram, I encountered a mother unwilling to collapse her foldable pram to accommodate my wheelchair. There's no space, she insisted. 
ignoring my need for accessibility. Mobility aid misunderstanding. A child will often approach me eyeing my fidget toy with curiosity. Before I can react, a parent has scolded me for taunting their child with a toy. This has also happened with a parent saying I should share my headphones, which is mega weird. Sweet surprise. Enjoying a quiet moment in a cafe, I took my medication, only to be confronted by a parent accusing me of selfishness. You should share with the children unaware that my sweets were medication. The disabled toilet, go ahead, use the disabled toilet. I am in no place to judge, and who doesn't and does need the disabled toilet. But please don't get snippy with me when I'm waiting for you to come out with your child. My mobility aid isn't a toy. This is a weirdly common one where a child will go to grab or touch my mobility aid, and I, out of instinct, pull it away and the parent will tell me off because the child is curious. These things cost a lot of money. It isn't a toy far from it. These instances are actually more common than you think, sadly. Don't get me wrong. I have zero issues with kids being curious about why I use a mobility aid, what's wrong with me, and asking other questions. Kids are curious, and I'm happy to teach your child just ask me nicely. I find parents are often the worst when it comes to me and my disabilities. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. My 32 female, husband, 36 male, became a robot, and I don't know how to help him. The title sounds insane, but here I go. We've been married for six years and have two kids. I'm pregnant with a third. My husband works from 9-5, comes home, does his chores, plays with our two kids, talks to me for a little bit, and then goes to sleep. But he doesn't seem to enjoy doing any of it, like this whole thing is one big chore. He used to be this goofy guy who smiled and told jokes all the time. But I haven't seen the man smile in months. It's not like he's neglecting his duties as a husband and father, but he acts like it's just that, duties. Like hanging with the kids and me is a second job. I'm grateful for all he's doing, and he makes all of our lives so much easier, but it's like he's constantly on the clock, and I think he might be depressed. I tried asking him if he was doing okay, and he told me he's doing fantastic, but I know he's not. That's the line he uses at work when customers try to make small talk and ask how he's doing. He doesn't take any time for himself. He doesn't take any breaks. He stopped playing games and stopped watching TV. He just does what I feel he thinks needs to be done, and I don't know how to help him out. I'm always the one initiating intimate displays of affection. He does everything in my POV because he feels it's his responsibility to make me happy. It feels like he isn't there in the moment, like his mind is wandering the whole time, and that, to me, feels worse than getting rejected. I don't know what's going on, and I don't know how to help because he won't let me in. To anybody else, he seems fine, but I know something is wrong and I don't know how to fix this. I miss my husband, the guy who complained and told jokes, not this robotic shell that looks like him. Edit. All right, it's clear to me now that my husband is overworked and burnt out. He comes home from work in a couple hours, and I'm going to sit him down and talk to him. I'm going to tell him how I feel, and I hope that together we can find a solution that turns him back into the man he once was. Update. My husband came home at around 6 o'clock, and after he had something to eat, I took him to the bedroom to talk. I sat him down on the bed and told him I was worried about him. I didn't know exactly how to phrase my worries, so I just showed him my original post. When he finished reading the post, he started crying like full-on crying. In all the years that I have known this man, I had never seen a tear roll down his eye. I held him for a few minutes until he could recompose himself, and he told me everything. He told me that the world was in a bad place right now, and that we're bringing a child into a stressful time. He said when I became pregnant, he felt he had to step up. He needed to take care of things because it was his responsibility. He said that the weight of carrying the family was so much harder than he anticipated, so he thought if he doubled down, he could get through it. But the more he tried, the darker the tunnel got, and eventually he couldn't see an end. He said that he feels like he's constantly drowning, and the only breath of fresh air is on the car ride between home and work. He said that sometimes the stress is so much that he throws up but doesn't tell anyone, and instead keeps going with his day. He then pulled out a pack of gum from his pocket and said this was for when it happens. I asked him why he couldn't tell me any of this, and he said he didn't want to burden me with the truth. He said that he thought if he told me everything that I would stop seeing him as a protector and provider and that I would inevitably stop loving him. 
Hearing him say that brought tears to my eyes because I didn't know where he got the notion I would feel that way. I asked him if he wanted to quit his job, but surprisingly he said the job doesn't bother him. He said the work in itself was fine. It's just now he feels an added weight to provide because not only was he fortunate enough to keep his job in the pandemic, but we also had a kid on the way. He said that some days he feels like packing a suitcase and running to some tropical island for a week and not telling anyone, but then he feels guilty and doubles down even more. I told him that maybe he should go on a trip. I said that he deserved a break, and maybe if he did exactly that, he'd feel better. He tried to protest, but I insisted. In the end said that he'll only go if we go together, like a romantic getaway between spouses. Once things start to clear up and before the baby is due, he wants to take a week off from work, drop the kids off at Grandma's house, and have us go on a vacation. Just the two of us, like we used to when we first got married. He also said he wants to take the day off tomorrow and just sleep in, so that's the plan. I'll call his boss tomorrow and say that he's sick and can't come in. It's not like they'll make a sick man come into work. There's a pandemic going on. Right now, he's playing with the kids, and it doesn't feel like he's doing one of his chores. He actually seems to be enjoying himself. For the first time in months, I don't see the robot. I see my husband. Edit. I want to thank you all for the support. I appreciate all of you. I want to clarify some things. First things first, my husband says hi. I wanted to clarify about the chores people are talking about. I want to say that I know as a stay-at-home mom, the bulk of chores goes to me. I cook and clean and do laundry because I know it's my responsibility. My husband's only chores are doing dishes, vacuuming every three days, and a few other house maintenance stuff. I did, in fact, call in sick for my husband, but I made sure that I said he had a migraine. I saw on Google that it wasn't a symptom of COVID if it was an isolated symptom. His boss was okay with it and said he can come back whenever he feels better. The pregnancy wasn't an accident. We both did want to have three kids because we were both raised in three kid families. We actively tried for the first two, but for baby number three, it was kind of a, if it happens, it happens kind of thing. We're both happy with the amount of kids we have will have and are hopefully done. We are not considering abortion nor adoption. We realize that a one-week vacation isn't enough to get rid of his stress and are both trying to come up with a solution that alleviates his stress in a more sustainable way. Right now, we're thinking about setting up an hour or two. My 46 male, septuagenarian father-in-law loves going to our kids' athletic events, football, soccer, baseball, softball, everything. The kids are great athletes and the games are a lot of fun. Father-in-law fits the stereotypical boomer profile. White, Catholic, Republicans, good at Democrats, bad. Fox News, talking points, or gospel. And nothing that runs contrary to his beliefs has any merit, no matter how practical or logical. We live a few blocks from he and mother-in-law. We see them regularly, and my mother-in-law is my wife's 40, best girlfriend. Mother-in-law comes over to the house several times every week. Rare is a day these two women don't speak at least once. They have a great relationship. I get frustrated with father-in-law, even as a guy that doesn't get upset about politics, but I love and support wife, and it's important to her that we have a good relationship with her mom and dad. Wife and I say to each other, man, he can be a dingling sometimes, but we want him in our lives and in our children's lives. We have our own flaws and understand that family can be frustrating, and the doctor swings both ways. In the past, we've had issues with father-in-law being overbearing at athletic events. He believes he's being supportive, but he's tone deaf as to how he sounds, very critical when offering helpful coaching at games. This past fall, in the middle of the season, our daughter, nine, asked if we could tell father-in-law to not come to soccer games because his coaching from the sidelines, very loud and grating, was making her uncomfortable. She didn't want to hurt his feelings and wanted us to send the message. When my wife mentioned it to her mom, who then passed it along to father-in-law, and his response through mother-in-law, was that our daughter would never ask him not to come to games? Well, she did. He seemed to accept that he needs to be more aware of how he comes across to the other players and parents. He sulked for a few weeks, but then got over it and was granted permission to come to games again after a brief talk about being less of a spectacle. No apologies, no promises to reform, just a harumph and sure. Here it comes. Basketball season gets going and my daughter's team plays well and makes it to the playoff. We were all in the gym for a playoff game a few weeks ago and not even a full quarter into the game. 
father-in-law is educating a mother from the opposing team on rules of the game. It's abrasive, not informative. It's I'm right, you're wrong. He knows he's being argumentative, and he's happy to prove to anyone in earshot how right he is. Things get to the point where the mother is moving seats to put some distance between her and father-in-law. I tap my wife to take her attention away from our daughter, playing to let her know that there's a situation. She's sitting on the other side of our group, and the noise in the gym is masking the increasing volume of the interaction. Why did I bring it to my wife's attention instead of addressing it myself? Because I have had interactions with father-in-law on this and other subjects, and my first inclination would be to tell him to shut the F up at a volume and tone that would startle adults as that would not be the best approach to diffuse the situation. My thought was that his grown adult daughter may have more success. We're looking to put water on a brush fire, not napalm. She walks to where he is and politely asks him to let it go, then comes back to sit. A few moments later, not even a full minute, father-in-law is back to educating the other mother. Wife gets up and asks him, more sternly, to knock it off, then returns to her seat. Parents from both teams are looking over to see what the commotion is. It's clear to everyone what's happening. Less than a minute later, he's back at it. Wife goes over again and tells him to stop talking. Father-in-law says, no, I will not. For some reason, this rocked me for two reasons. One, I'd never heard him speak to his daughter like that before. And two, I was floored by the lack of respect for his adult daughter and mother to five of his grandchildren. Maybe I'd been blind to it before, but it was so clear that he would walk over her if his ego was threatened. I was equally enraged and sad. I had had enough. I lean over, make eye contact with him, and say, loud enough to be heard over the basketball game, shut your mouth. I'm surprised the F word didn't make it in there. He stops talking, doesn't say a word for the rest of the game. When the game is over, he leaves without a goodbye or congratulations to my daughter for the win. Wife and I know there's going to be blowback, and that I'm going to be the bad guy in father-in-law's narrative. I'm okay with that. I can be the uh, hole in his fiction. My ego will survive. Wife and I know what happened, and I want father-in-law to know that I'll stand up to anyone that disrespects his daughter, even him. What I'm not okay with father-in-law's treatment of his daughter. I suggest to wife that if father-in-law is ever to come to another game, that three things need to happen. One, father-in-law apologizes to wife. Two, father-in-law will behave at all functions. Three, father-in-law agrees that if anyone ever asks him to stop, he will do so immediately. Strangers, coaches, referees. The next day, my wife gets a call from mother-in-law to announce father-in-law's decision on what our punishment will be. He will not come to our house if I'm there, no events where I am present, and he will not be attending Easter Sunday brunch with us. My thought was, wow, you're going to back yourself into a corner here, aren't you? Okay, let's see how you play poker with no chips. Wife tells father-in-law through mother-in-law because we're children and have to play telephone that he will not be allowed to attend softball or baseball games if he maintains his position. We haven't had any direct interaction with him in a few weeks. But wife and mother-in-law talk daily. Mother-in-law saying that father-in-law is her husband and she has to support him. Wife explains that one can support their spouse without supporting every thought, feeling, or action. Mother-in-law is in a bad spot because father-in-law is essentially pushing her to take his side for acting like a butt. Otherwise, she's not a supportive spouse. Very childlike behavior from a senior citizen. Over this past weekend, I was traveling and got a call from my wife. The Cold War had gone hot. Mother-in-law called to ask what time our daughter's softball games will be this weekend. Wife tells her the times and reminds her that she is welcome, but father-in-law is not. Mother-in-law says, that's silly. It's been long enough. Wife says, these are literally the first games of the season. He has not missed any athletic events. There have been no consequences for him yet. No, he is not invited. This is where things get dark. Mother-in-law ups the ante and asks if wife is planning to be at the games. Wife says that she will be, and mother-in-law says, then I don't want to go. Your father is wrong for not respecting you, but you need to respect him. I don't want to be around you if you can't respect your father. My heart hurt when I heard this. Wife loves her mother and they are close friends. Father-in-law is making mother-in-law stand behind his misbehavior and causing a rift between mother-in-law and wife. Wife says that she's hurt by mother-in-law, 
but if she wants to hurt feelings, wife will play along. Wife says there will be no contact with our families. Mother-in-law says, you're not going to keep the grandchildren from us, are you? Wife, yes. That's where things stand as of today. I'm not sure how this will play out, but I believe father-in-law is about to learn how truly feckless he is. Now this just happened like a while ago. I'm actually still a bit mad about this. So this happened during lunch. We had a tour that came in to look at the campus. We had a few students here who are vision impaired, which means their eyesight is just terrible and they need a cane. There's one student completely blind. The tour group came into the lunchroom to eat. They wait in line behind the vision impaired group. Now I was already sitting at a table with a couple of friends eating lunch with them till I looked over at the group. The blind guy accidentally drops his money out of his pocket while getting his phone out. He must have felt something fall out because he started feeling around on the ground. A woman spotted the $20 bill and picked it up without the blind guy noticing and stuck it in her purse. I was a bit shocked by what happened. I went to one of the staff and told them what I witnessed, and they brought in a security guard and told him the same story. The woman was now sitting at a table with her son, which Pepu isn't entitled. At least I don't think he was. The security guard came over and started asking her questions. She declined stealing money and said I'm a liar. The cameras say otherwise, though, Karen. I was sitting back at my table, watching the woman rumbling on. Well, it's not my fault that he dropped his money on the ground. I should keep it. Finder keepers, loser weepers. She actually said it like a two-year-old. Security guards threatened to take her to jail if she doesn't return the money. She turned pale and she returned the money. She and her son had to finish lunch in the bus and waited there till the tour group finished. I walked by the bus while heading to class. I looked at her and waved. She gives me a very childish glare, which I roll my eyes at and walk back to my class. Well, I know the story isn't crazy as others I've seen here, but still a bit mad that someone would do that to a blind man. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences, opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.